Okay. Okay, everybody, why don't we go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Um, I am Steve Jerzyk. I'm the um, Associate Administrator at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, and it's my privilege to moderate this panel this afternoon. Um, I used to have a more fun job. I was Associate Administrator for the Space Technology Mission Director. The guy who runs it now is clapping. That's, that's Jim Ryder. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, yeah, so technology uh, for exploration is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and it always, it always has been in my career. I've kind of been a, a, a technologist for a lot of my career. So um, we have some great panelists today. And, um, you know, we're really, we're really focusing in this session on in, uh, technologies and capabilities for in situ resource utilization, and which is a really important capability because um, we are going. We are going forward to the moon with Artemis. Have you guys heard of Artemis? Just, yeah. So with the, pro, the NASA program Artemis, um, and we're, you know, we're using the moon, um, and we're going back sustainably, right? And uh, we're using the moon for scientific purposes um, and to develop, the tech, develop and demonstrate the technologies, capabilities, and operational concepts to eventually, for human missions, to Mars, and, uh, and also to exploit and use resources on the moon potentially um, that will enable uh, sustainability around and on the moon, that will enable Mars missions, and some of that technology will feed forward to um, hopefully the ISRU on, on the red planet. Um, there are lots of other technologies that are required um, to eventually for a human mission to Mars, um, entry, descent, and landing technologies, um, many technologies to keep the crew health and safety uh, safe on the trip, uh, in space transportation and propulsion technologies, but we're gonna focus today's this, this, this panel on ISRU, right? So I'm gonna let, I'm gonna go, we'll go, first we'll go through and let the panelists introduce themselves. They know themselves better than I do, so I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves, just who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your background. Uh, then we're gonna go, go back through and, uh, and let them talk for about five minutes or so, and then we'll go to Q&A. So real quick, just introductions, and we'll come back and start with Jennifer for, for remarks. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Edmondson. I am a planetary geologist. I got my PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences. And to make a joke about the typo that I've gotten the title, that's supposed to be a geologist. Actually, I did uh, do some isotopic dating on some Apollo 17 samples for my dissertation work, so I guess you could call me an a geologist. I guess. Um, I came to Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm actually with the Jacobs Space Exploration Group working for Marshall Space Flight Center um, under the Engineering Services and Science Capability Augmentation Contract. Um, I came on board as the junior geologist for the Planetary Regolith Simulant Team. And because the person who was managing that project was also managing the Manufacturing Innovation Program, I actually started working in in-space manufacturing even before it was in-space manufacturing. So I'm still working there today. I've also do, done a lot of work and um, just trying to bring along the ISRU technologies, specifically those that are relevant to in-space manufacturing and additive construction, surface construction work. Thank you. Um, Naoki Sato, JAXA. I, uh, I've been working for the uh, International Space Station program for many years, I mean, maybe 20 years or so, since the 1990. Uh, the, after that, I, I joined the uh, International Space Exploration World uh, since then, uh, I mean, the 20, 2010 time frame. And uh, uh, actually, the, uh, the ISEC-G, uh, International Space Exploration Coordination Group, uh, was established uh, at the time, and I, I have been working for the uh, ISEG G uh, so many years, uh, ten, ten, day, 10 years or so. And uh, the, also the, uh, in JAXA, uh, we have established a new uh, organization, which is the JAXA Space Exploration Center last year. And uh, I was assigned to the uh, director of the system technology unit of the, uh, the JAXA Space Exploration Center. Sure. 
Hey, so I'm uh, George Sowers. I'm a professor of space resources at the Colorado School of Mines, uh, supporting the world's first and only graduate program in space resources. We're in our second full year of uh, operating a, a fully online program, and we have 75 students, which is <clears throat> pretty incredible uh, and shows a tremendous interest in the field of space resources. Um, I, always, I typically shy away from ISRU because that's kind of a, a niche application. Um, but my background is in big aerospace. I spent 30 years at Mart Marietta, then Lockheed Martin, and finally United Launch Alliance. Uh, designing and building and launching rockets, and I uh, got interested in space resources uh, when we were developing upper stages that could be refueled. And uh, refueling is a, is a major game changer in space, but you need sources of fuel. And so that's been my focus is, you know, where do we get the fuel? And one of the places is the moon. Hi there, I'm Nikki Workheiser. I work for the uh, NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate and wearing two hats uh, currently. One we'll talk hopefully a, a good bit about today is uh, leading the new Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative, uh, which I am absolutely thrilled about and can't wait to share more information um, on that, as well as the program executive for our Game Changing Development Program. Uh, before that, uh, I've worked for years with the in-space manufacturing uh, project that Jennifer referred to on uh, basically our mantra was make it, uh, don't take it, on how we can actually have sustainable missions and design for maintainability, um, use all the resources around us as, as feedstock uh, for manufacturing and repair and recycling. And the majority of my career has really been in uh, hardware and technology development for both um, shuttle and space station. And I would have to say um, probably what is most near and dear to my heart is uh, kind of working between government, industry, and academia. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with small businesses, um, small and large, as well as institutes, universities, um, et cetera, to, to bring all this to fruition. I think that's the most exciting part. So I look forward to talking today. Okay, so now I'd like to give uh, each of our panelists three to five minutes to give us their thoughts on space resources <laughs> and utilization. I'm a, I, I, I can be retrained. Um, so we'll start with Jennifer and we'll just go, go through and then we'll do some Q&A. Okay, okay, I think that the moon is a great untapped resource. I think we can find a lot of materials and one of the best things about the moon is that it's gone through a lot of geologic processes. So we have a lot of concentrations of different elements that are of economic interest. We have concentration of the volatiles in the permanently shadowed regions. We have concentration of you know, uranium and rare earth elements in certain parts of the moon. I, I think it's a great resource that we really need to look into tapping. OK, uh, I have just talked uh, about the, our, our study results in the ballroom A <laughs> in just uh, 30 minutes ago. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, a little bit iterate the, uh, my talk. So anyway, the, the, for the ISRU, to talk about the ISRU uh, benefit, uh, the systematic and the strategic uh, approach is very important. So uh, based on our uh, systematic analysis, the ISRU uh, break, we have, uh, I think there is a break even point for the ISRU. But uh, we, uh, we think that uh, it depends on the water uh, content rate on the lunar surface. So that's why the, the, uh, for the first place, I think the water prospecting uh, with a reasonable uh, target uh, range and the reasonable uh, accuracy, uh, the water prospecting uh, is very important. And also, the, uh, based on the, our ISRU uh, system uh, study, it shows that the Major uh, mass contribution contribution of the ISRU plant uh, is the storage. The storage is very massive for the uh, ISRU plant. So the, uh, it's very important to reduce the weight of the storage system. And also the uh, major power contributor to the uh, ISRU system is liquefaction. So the, uh, those points uh, is very important. And uh, uh, in Japan, uh, on JAXA is uh, currently researching uh, some critical technology. So uh, for the storage, uh, the, the advanced, the advanced uh, summer uh, MRI is very good to reduce the weight of the storage. So 
we are now uh, researching on the uh, uh, advanced MRI system. And also the uh, liquefaction uh, is important, but uh, uh, currently we are not researching on the, the more uh, advanced technology on the uh, liquefaction. But uh, I think uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very critical technology for the uh, mass reduction of the uh, ISRU system. That's all. Thanks. George? Okay, so the subject of this panel, I think, is technologies for sustainable lunar presence. Um, so we have to think about what sustainability means. And to me, it means ongoing, useful, and affordable. So it has to be you know, extending over a long period of time, delivering value useful to the, either the taxpayer or to a shareholder, um, and affordable. And if you're in the private sector, affordability means you're profitable, um, that your revenues exceed your costs. Um, and if you're profitable, then by definition, you're sustainable. If you're making money, you can keep it going. Um, so one of the largest costs of any lunar program is space transportation. And uh, as one of, the, one of the panels earlier today, uh, I, I think I heard numbers of like 70 to 80% of the cost of the lunar program is going to be in transportation. Uh, now, Earth to orbit transportation to Earth to LEO transportation is undergoing intense competition, so I think those prices are coming down um, because of free market forces. Um, low Earth orbit to, to the moon transportation can be dramatically reduced by refueling. So that's kind of one of that's kind of one of the hooks. So looking for a source of fuel in space, we can look no further than the moon. Uh, a lot of data that is mounting that the poles of the moon harbor large quantities of ice, which can be extracted, um, split through electrolysis into hydrogen and oxygen and liquefied into rocket propellant. Um, that dramatically lowers the cost of space transportation. Uh, my numbers say that you know, the cost to go from Earth to the moon using lunar propellant refueling on the, on the trip uh, can be reduced by a factor of three. Going from Earth to the gateway using lunar propellant can be reduced by a factor of two. Um, so that gives you a lot of leverage and a lot of hooks into sustainability. Um, it also feeds directly into technologies. Um, we've done, we're in the process of doing architecture studies um, actually th uh, through a NIAC grant. Um, thank you to your former um, or Jim Ryder out there, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> But uh, a lot of the technologies that you need to develop the capability to extract and process water on the moon are enabling for almost anything we want to do on the moon. There's communications that you need. You need large quantities of power uh, to do both the heating of the material to sublimate the ice and electrolysis and liquefaction and all the rest of it. Um, you need construction. The very first thing you build when you're setting up a lunar propellant plant is a landing pad because otherwise every subsequent landing is blasting, you know, sharp edge dust across everything you landed before. Um, so you need construction capability early on. Um, the list goes on and on. And, you know, then the chemical processing and, and the rest of that for propellant um, and distribution. So, you know, if we go that way first, we pick up a lot of those technologies along the way and enable potentially, you know, sustainable government-sponsored exploration and hopefully profitable businesses to form around that. Okay, um, so I just want to spend a moment and first of all just acknowledge that uh, we are living in a very exciting time and, and why I'm so incredibly stoked about Artemis is I didn't get to experience Apollo directly but um, I think what is different about today also are the amazing collaboration opportunities that we have across the government with industry and academia to work together to make this happen, right? We didn't have necessarily the same methodology and approach for Apollo, um, so there are a lot of collaborative efforts that we're working as part of the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative that I want to spend some, some time discussing today, and of course ISRU is one of the, the primary ones of those. Um, so for STMD, I, I feel like we have the coolest job, as, as Steve mentioned, um, to, to work to retire the kind of primary technology hurdles uh, that we face for any of these given capabilities at a relevant scale. 
Um, then those capabilities can even be scaled up further by a commercial industry or other NASA users. Um, but to me, the really exciting part, kind of where the miracle occurs here and the magic is in that technology development and, and to really um, push past those technology hurdles and, and do the demonstrations and the work to get there. Uh, so for LSII in particular, there are uh, six major areas. There are ISRU, of course, um, construction and excavation, uh, extreme access, extreme environments, uh, dust mitigation, power, and I think, is that, I think that's six. Yeah, that's all of them. Um, so all of these, of course, for a mission are very integrated um, from a system perspective. ISRU is one example of that. Uh, we have the pure kind of production capability uh, development that we need to do, as well as excavation. Of course, we all need power. Um, we've all got to deal with dust and mitigating the dust. Um, so we're working that from a very systems approach. One of the things I'm hoping um, to talk more about today is uh, the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium uh, that we're going to be establishing. We're working with um, the Applied Physics Labs on an initial task now, um, looking at how we can have this consortium that's composed of government as well as industry and academia. Where on the NASA side, we can really kind of talk about um, those key kind of core capability needs um, and the, the, uh, the real figures and merits for those, and then have a real dialogue with industry and academia on the value proposition. Um, of course, we are all going to need to set up a, a basic lunar infrastructure, um, a certain amount of power and mobility, um, and to be able to survive the environments. Um, so how we can come together to do that and really work on um, a collaborative model to have unique public-private partnerships to, um, to, to execute that um, and to get started today um, as quickly as possible uh, to getting there. Um, in developing those, those technologies and overcoming those primary hurdles are, are really the focus of my job. Uh, so look forward to questions. I don't want to spend any more time talking because questions are my favorite part. Uh, so I'll pause there and turn back over to Steve. Okay. Hey, great, great everybody. Thank you for that. Um, so we're open for questions from the audience. We have a mic that we're going to run around. If you can wait for the mic and introduce yourself and, and ask your question. Good evening, everyone. My name is Isaiah. I'm an uh, aerospace engineer based out of uh, Alabama, right in Huntsville, right on Arsenal, when you all said uh, Marshall. So I wanted to know, speaking of the consortium that Ms. That Ms. Nikki uh, spoke about with the academia and industry and uh, government forces, how would a lot of this stuff actually be funded? Would it be a consortium? Would it be more private side, more government side? How would a lot of this stuff actually be paid for? As Mr. George talked about, you know, the money is important. So how does this <laughs> Sure, yes, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, I mentioned public-private partnerships, for example, and really we have a whole um, spectrum and array of what I'll call collaborative mechanisms, which is our AA's favorite terminology over there. Um, so, so really we have everything from uh, small business awards. For example, in our in-space manufacturing program, uh, we flew three novel technologies on space station within six years, all through our small business innovation research awards. Um, I think we're moving more and more toward um, even more agile, flexible, and meaningful um, collaborations with public-private partnerships, such as our, our BAAs, for example. And that's why I think it's, it's so critical when I talked about having this consortium where we can have kind of that open and continuous dialogue on identifying the value propositions because, I mean, let's be honest, we, like, like I said, we all need a certain amount of power and we need to get around the moon and we need to survive the environment. So a lot of industry and academia is going to be working toward that as well as NASA. So there's a lot of um, kind of immediate near term, especially in terms of technology development, low hanging fruit that we'll have public private partnerships for. Um, of course, one of the government's main jobs is to enable um, things, enable infrastructure and industry in areas that aren't necessarily profitable from the on start. So I think having those conversations helps us to understand where the value propositions are so that we can make those solicitations m even more value added um, and what we aim those at. And then also make sure that we're working in-house to develop and establish the infrastructure needed to create that ecosystem so it can thrive. Um, I hope that helped. And kind of feeding on that, we also have the cooperative agreement notice um, mechanism where NASA will fund half of the research and then a university will fund the other half of the research. So you kind of get double your money that way. Absolutely, yeah. George, do you want to comment on private investment and public-private partnerships at all? Yeah, sure. I, I think 
there is profit potential in a lot of these lunar businesses. Um, you know, and again, speaking on what my current uh, interest is, is on the, you know, the water mining aspect of it. You know, we've been talking to a lot of you know, mining and oil and gas and other companies that you know, have the traditional terrestrial expertise in these kinds of industries. And you know, five years ago, when you talked space mining to these folks, you would get giggles um, or smirks. Uh, now they're not smirking anymore, they're actually listening. But they have proven processes, and, and we talked about it in the last panel. You know, the, the, the knowledge of the, of the geologic knowledge of the ice at the, uh, on the lunar poles is, is very sparse. I mean, we, we've never landed and actually seen that there's ice there. We have remote sensing data. So the geologic knowledge is not there. The, uh, the knowledge of the, uh, the technologies and the, uh, you know, the, to extract it, the economics of it, the, you know, there's a lot of risk, way more risk than a terrestrial company would absorb right now. And so, you know, to the extent that NASA can help through some public-private partnerships to buy down some of this risk, there will eventually be a tipping point where these, these industries with large access to capital and expertise will decide, okay, now we can come in. Uh, we're not there yet, we got a ways to go, but I think the LSII is a great place to start. Noki, do you want to comment on uh, JAXA's strategy for moving the technologies and capabilities forward and any partnerships you might have with the industry? Uh, yes, I think the, the Japan's, uh, Japan situation is a much different uh, with, uh, the, with the U.S. situation because the space market is much smaller uh, in Japan than the uh, U.S. So uh, the situation is much different. So currently uh, the, the fund to, to develop the technology for the future, future applications such as the, uh, the space exploration uh, will be uh, uh, we came from the uh, government. But uh, I, we established some uh, framework to, to promote the such uh, uh, technology uh, can be used for the space and also the grant technology. So uh, it's called the Innovation Hub Center uh, within the JAXA. But uh, anyway, that the fund comes from, uh, comes from the government, but uh, uh, we created such kind of framework and uh, I, that is currently operating very well. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Yash. I'm a student at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, I just want to get you guys' input on uh, what the timeline is kind of going to look like for mining and in situ resource um, operations on the moon or Mars, for that matter. Like, um, how how do you think the technology is going to mature as we develop the capabilities to ap actually travel there? Um, is it going to be fully autonomous? This mining, these mining operations. What level of human input? do you think is going to have to be there by the time we get there, by the time the actual travel technology is mature? George, you want to start? Go ahead, Go ahead George. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, you know, I've laid out a timeline in some of the architecture studies that we're working on at the School of Mines, a timeline for, you know, basically 10 years between now and, and industrial scale production of propellant on the moon. You know, I, I fully recognize that's an aggressive timeline, but if nobody, if, if I'm not aggressive about it, nobody else will be. Um, and uh, we were just on a panel with Alex McDonald, whom you know, yes. and so Alex will always pull me back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you need that, you need that, you know, that tension between the optimist and the, and the pessimist. But I think 10 years is, is achievable if we really wanted to do it. You know, the first part of it is that exploration, characterizing the ice, and you can do that um, in large part using CLIPS, uh, another great NASA program uh, that will help this. Um, buying down technology risk through programs like the LSII, and then eventually you'll get to that tipping point where, you know, one of these deep pocket players will jump in and decide, hey, I can go do this now. And in that, in that case, you know, from that point on, you're maybe looking at four or five years. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that to reiterate, I think um, it starts today and it's very much um, a phased process that we build upon and you do have to start early. And so we, we do coordinate closely with our uh, science mission directorate uh, colleagues and are looking at how we can utilize the early uncrewed uh, CLIPS flights to do exactly what George is saying, to buy down those uh, 
those technology hurdles, technology risks early on, which then continues to inform our, our subsystem demos and eventually our, our scaled systems. You talked about um, a human in the loop, uh, the crew, obviously there are um, critical needs for uh, autonomy and remote operations, especially when you're talking about things possibly in, um, in shadowed regions or um, that, that represent uh, real safety issues that we need um, autonomy and robotics um, and systems. And so all of this kind of ties together as a larger integrated story. When you start looking at your environments, we're talking about really cold temperatures and extreme environments, um, sensing, autonomy, robotics, um, the power that you need to do that. All of these start early in our, our uncrewed uh, clips, flights um, with technology demos as well as um, other mechanisms through flight opportunities and such. I do think there's been a lot of focus on the mining the volatiles from the permanently shadowed regions, but of course there's resources all over the moon. And um, I'll kind of just pull on the uh, objectives from the Lunar ISRU workshop that just happened in July. Um, we need to find out exactly what constitutes a lunar resource. Can we use just the minerals that are there? Can we mine you know, the metals out of the minerals? Can we take the silicon dioxide that makes that part of the minerals and use that for, you know, superconductors or something like that. We need to characterize the materials, so we need to determine and work with SMD and the planetary science community saying, you know, what measurements do we need to make? Uh, what form are the resources in? Are they just freely sitting on the surface and we can, you know, sieve them out or something? Or do we need to actually break down the chemical structure of a mineral to get them out? And then what prospecting technology can we use? Um, remote sensing versus the ground truth. And we definitely need input from the planetary science community there. They also have extract and process. And I like to combine these two because it involves the excavation, beneficiation, which means concentration of a specific mineral or resource of interest. And then the processing of the resource that it takes to actually get the desired material that you need for feedstock for additive manufacturing or um, propellant or, or whatever else you need. And then there's marketing, which basically means we need to bring in industry partners and academia, international partners, to be able to help us further develop this technology to scale it up and to be able to actually use it real time on the lunar surface. Okay. Yes, uh, so the, in the ISEG-G, uh, we are talking about the uh, next uh, 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 revision of the scenario, total scenario, and uh, we are talking about three phases. So first phase is, of course, the uh, ultimate phase one, uh, up to the 2024. But uh, in that time frame, uh, the, our idea is to, uh, uh, to uh, pros prospect the resources, uh, including water and other resources, up to 2024 time frame. And the next phase, uh, the phase two, uh, from 20, 2025 to to somewhere, <laughs> and uh, the, in the phase two, uh, our idea is to uh, completely uh, demonstrate the ISRU technology. Then we, uh, the phase, at the phase three, uh, we're going to utilize the uh, uh, utilization phase of the ISRU, and um, of course, the maybe uh, transition to the commercialization of the uh, moon activities. Uh, so uh, we have not, uh, uh, discuss the uh, exact date uh, of the uh, actual ISRU uh, utilization, uh, but uh, I'm a little bit uh, op optimistic next to the George. <laughs> so I, I think that it will be the 2030 time frame. Okay, very good, thank you. Next question. Any, oh, and go to the back first, and then we'll come to the front. Um, Chris Easton from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, so we've talked a lot about partnerships and, between nations and private and, and in, or private industry and academia, uh, and, and there's a big push for this open architecture on gateway. How do we actually break down those ITAR barriers, or how do we actually make it so that the IP that private companies create uh, becomes a public resource that other people can plug into? Because that's that's a big a uh, big problem that we're facing right now, and we need to solve this for tech in the future. So, so I'm not sure I'll answer the, the specific question, and, and, uh, but, but I will say 
Um, from a NASA perspective, I think what we're really focusing on um, with LSII is identifying what our core capability needs are. Um, we're really moving kind of away from being process specific or um, even you know finite requirement ease, but more looking at what our, our true capability needs are, um, kind of what our minimum objectives and, and then desired outcomes as we move more towards sustainability. Um, and working with industry and academia to, um, I think that's really where the, the, the value added is, is, is seeing what novel processes or different approaches that might be utilized um, to get to that end game. I know that doesn't specifically answer the ITAR question, but I do think having um, more public dialogue through consortiums and, and institutes and venues like this one that are capability focused and leave the bandwidth in the room open um, for novel processes and, and capabilities and approaches does at least um, kind of broaden the perspective and the, and the solution sets that we get back. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the key, the key baby is um, if we can establish a certain infrastructure on the surface um, and define the interfaces to that infrastructure. So George mentioned the physical infrastructure like pads and other things that are needed, right, that people could utilize. Uh, power, right, have power on the surface and standard interfaces, the, you know, standard voltage levels, current levels, physical connections, et cetera. Um, so if we can like, talk about uh, what, what crew time could be expected to deploy your system and, and maintain your system, right? The, the interfaces with the crew and, and a common or, and standard common interfaces. So if we can establish that in, infrastructure on the surface that has those uh, you know, uh, well-defined interfaces, then anyone, hopefully from any country or industry, can develop a capability and utilize that infrastructure on the surface to, for space resources. So I think that's the key. We don't. We don't know. We need, don't need to know what's in your box. We just you, you need, just need to know the gazintas and gazautas and and the functionality that and the capability you will provide, and so that we can integrate that into the overall architecture and campaign. I think that's kind of the approach we're taking on Gateway, and I think it it does an analogy on surface. The capabilities are yep. some are similar, some are different, but the, if we can if we can do the same sort of thing, establish an architecture with service capabilities and interfaces that folks can plug into and utilize, that might be a way to do it. Yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah, I, I think about it in economic terms. I mean, we don't have we don't worry about people's IP and on you know when we're buying power off the electrical grid or selling power into the electrical grid. You just know what that commodity is and you can sell it. Same for propellant. Um, you know, like Steve said, we don't need to know what's in the black box as long as we specify what, what it is that we're buying and selling. And so to me, you know, in the terrestrial economy, those things work themselves out as agreements between, you know, parties that want to do business with each other. If they want to exchange IP, they can have NDAs. If they want to sell things to each other, it happens, you know, with a, with a commercial contract. And uh, I, I think those kind of things work themselves out. And on the ITAR front, I, I would hope that the stuff we do on the moon has not got a lot of ITAR tendrils into it. <laughs> One would hope. Uh, we're having those discussions, <laughs> believe it or not. And yeah, so I think there's, yeah, I, I, there are just, I, so this is a frustration for me, right? I, I am envious of the space of a science mission director because they have these great international collaborations on science. I'm envious of, obviously, of human exploration because of ISS. I mean, it's just an amazing international yeah. collaboration. And it, but in space technology, it's like, you know, as soon as something, you know, can translate to a, a rocket, mm -hmm. right, or can translate to an entry system, then we, we get kind of wrapped around the axle about being able to co-develop technologies. So we tend to focus on really early stage technology development, data sharing for testing and that sort of thing, pre-competitive stuff. Um, but yeah, I'd like to do more. I always wanted to do more internationally on the technology side. It's just a little bit more challenging. But I, I agree with George with respect to the moon. And I'd be remiss if I didn't add too while we're talking this. Um, we have Lynn Bucco here who, who leads our Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation where we do um, quite a suite of crowdsourcing type activities. So just as, as Steve is mentioning where we kind of have um, kind of an open architecture, uh, there are going to be some interesting um, activities and, and opportunities coming out through COSI, um, through some of our partners there. We've done things with GrabCAD in the past and others where um, we can release kind of a capability need like we talked about or a basic kind of um, open um, architecture design and then ask for um, crowdsourcing ideas on how we meet certain figures of merit or um, improve upon certain capabilities. 
um, which I think offers a lot of opportunities on the NASA side and externally. And we have really received amazing results. I was quite naive before this experience to um, just the plethora of opportunities and that you can get across a spectrum of areas, um, both general and finite with the crowdsourcing uh, venue. So we'll be doing a good bit of that through the LSII um, activity as well. Very good. I think we had a question up front. No question. Nope, I'm sorry, over here first, sorry. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Austin Murnay, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Latham and Watkins, and I'm also a student. Uh, I've been taking classes for the last year with the Space Resources Program at the School of Mines. So it's uh, good to finally meet you in person, uh, <laughs> Dr. Sowers. Uh, I, I had a question, uh, I guess, for all the panelists about the level of confidence and the level of comfort you're seeing uh, in the industry side regarding space resources, specifically how comfortable they are with the legal right to acquire and use resources in space. I'd imagine that the 2015 Space Act did a lot to put people's minds at ease. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any pressure from the industry side asking for more, either legislatively or in regulation. And I, I would also ask uh, uh, Mr. Sato if you could weigh in if there's any difference that you're seeing uh, as the chair of the ISECG uh, among nations in terms of the approach uh, that they're looking at in terms of commercial acquisition of space resources. First? Yes, so uh, I think the, mm, the, so Japan is a different uh, situation. So uh, currently the mm, very few, uh, very few companies uh, working on the ISRU. And uh, of course they are, uh, uh, they are talking about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, space law issues about the uh, ISRU. So uh, I think uh, in Japan, we don't have any, any law about the uh, ISRU uh, on, the, uh, on the moon. So uh, maybe we need to establish uh, uh, some, some law uh, to, uh, to accelerate their activities. Uh, as for the ISEC-G, the activities, uh, currently we, don't, we, don't, uh, we haven't discussed so much about the uh, commercial activity and the I ISRU uh, the uh, rights uh, to, uh, for the uh, space exploration, but uh, I believe that uh, these uh, issues will come uh, soon uh, in the our ISEC G. Yeah, so uh, you know, you said it exactly right. If you're if you're a U.S. company or a U.S. person, um, you have the benefit of the 2015 uh, CS you know, Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act that basically established property rights for extracted materials. So if you're a U.S. company or, or entity, you can own what you extract from a, from a space body. Um, you know, the Outer Space Treaty that U.S. is a signatory to says that you can't appropriate the body itself or claim sovereignty over it, um, but you can own the resource. Um, I think that, you know, U.S. led the way. Luxembourg uh, in 2016 passed a similar kind of law, so they've you know, it's kind of a foothill, foothold into Europe uh, for that approach. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, counter opinion in the international community uh, that, that uh, believes that resources in space should be the, you know, the providence, providence of all mankind. And uh, so I think there's still a lot of debate to happen um, and a lot of way, a long way to go before it's settled in an international level. But if you're a U.S. company, then you've got a little bit of top cover. Yep. And um, I think it was last Friday, NASA released a study on planetary protection. Uh, Dr. Alan Stern led it. We had 80 recommendations. Alan could have made it a better job of winnowing that down, but we got 80 recommendations. I'll give him a hard time about that later, but we got 80 recommendations, and um, it's really looking at how do you protect parts, uh, parts of planetary bodies, um, or even planetary, small planetary bodies, but allow exploration and resource extraction, right? So how do you balance the science interests with the interests of you know, uh, countries and industries who want to ext extract resources? So, uh, obviously, with 80 recommendations, we got a lot of work to do there, but and that, and that work will be done not not just by NASA, but internationally and through COSPAR. So, uh, more to come on that. Yeah, there, there has been uh, an international group uh, that's been organized in Europe by the the Hague, which is called the Hague Group. It's uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands, 
has sponsored a group. Um, you know, School of Mines is one of their advisors. Um, but they've put together a, a draft set of 19 points uh, that would establish the next level of detail. You know, how do you establish a mining claim, for example? You know, how do you get permission and who do you get permission from if you want to actually go mine something on a, on a celestial body? And so they've come up with an approach that, you know, is trying to, to maybe, you know, split the difference between, you know, sort of the, the Wild West approach that you might get, you know, in the United States versus, you know, more regulated approach that you might get somewhere else. So that, that's all ongoing. I think there's a long way to go yet on yeah. all that. Yeah, we could spend a lot of time on this. Is a, this question is a really rich area to explore and a lot of work to do. Okay, I think we have time at least for one more question up here. Oh, <laughs> we're going to first before you get seconds, I guess. Maybe two more questions since we started a little late. Hello. Uh, my name is Daniel Tompkins, and I'm a, I work in biotechnology and agriculture. And um, to me, sustainability has a different context, probably. And um, I think part of this story is um, on self-reliance and using what you have to do a lot. And I was just wondering if you could comment on, on maybe that part of the story being brought into this more. Well. So, yeah, I want to go back because one of the focuses is for, particularly for Mars is reduced logistics burden. So, yeah, if you want to comment so on that. So that's, it. I guess Jennifer and I both could, could talk this, and I could talk probably much longer than anybody has on how strongly I feel about this. Um, to, to truly be Earth independent, um, which Space Station, by the way, has been just a fantastic test bed. Um, we have learned so much and continue to learn so much, uh, but we are still very Earth dependent, obviously. Um, the moon is a perfect test bed for us for the first time to really experience Earth independence, which means um, that it is a paradigm shift and that we do have to be able to look at everything around us as a resource. Um, uh, everything can be potential feedstock, for example. Um, when we talk about um, growing vegetables, for example, we've looked at vegetables that have a high cellulose content and how we can turn that cellulose into feedstock for printing. Um, we're looking at how um, uh, most of our medical and food um, consumables on space station and, and I'm sure on our lunar and, and Mars missions as well are um, polymers that can then be recycled and reused. Uh, little things even like um, otoscope specula. We do normal ear exams, right? And you spit those out and throw them away. That's, that is a material we can reuse time and time again. Um, we work with companies, uh, I think TechShot's one of the companies that was here that just uh, is doing bioprinting on Space Station and looking at how we can um, actually um, print organs or skin grafts. But in addition to that, you could even print food. I mean, you could print uh, uh, meat, for example, on long duration missions. Um, so absolutely, it's an exciting time. And this is another area where um, we are just absolutely uh, wrought with collaborative um, opportunities on, with terrestrial-based um, companies in terms of not only the technologies, but the materials development, um, the processes, uh, things like that. So um, I think that is truly the definition of sustainability and earth independence um, that has a lot of positive uh, commercial terrestrial applications as well as for our, our space missions. And of course, we're trying to live off the land, so we need to mine the minerals and the resources that are there. And at least the rock-forming minerals that are on the moon are the same ones that you'll find on Mars. So as long as we have that technology developed, we can test it out on the moon, and we have that path forward to Mars. And you look at somewhere like Hawaii, for example, where they have to import much of their concrete. It's quite expensive for buildings and parking lots. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have a basalt-based um, soil that we can, um, we've been testing and experimenting with on how you could use that for additive construction of pads or um, habitats and other structures too. Okay, one last question, if we have one. Do we have one up, up here or no? <laughs> okay, he gets a second. <laughs> <laughs> So my uh, background is a bachelor's in mechanical uh, from Alabama A&M and a uh, focus in uh, aerospace. Being based in Alabama, what is it that students and young professionals can do to further themselves in this area? So um, I think we are living in a time that has more opportunity than ever. And I'll, I'm, I'm only speaking because I'm in Huntsville and I feel like he's a cohort in that. Um, so there are really endless opportunities. We have. Um, 
institutes and, uh, and um, opportunities through our um, STTRs, for example, through our universities. Um, of course, we have um, early career initiatives and, uh, and early career faculty type um, activities going on across um, within the government and external to the government. Um, there, there really are just kind of endless opportunities. I do um, think going to, are you, are you still a student or are you out? Did you say, you graduated, okay. Well, heck, come get a job, we can, we can use you. <laughs> Check USA Jobs for sure. You wanna add from a student perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm going to say. You can get an advanced degree from the Colorado School of Mines, um, <laughs> from the comfort of your living room in, in Alabama. Um, but, but beyond advanced degrees, which is always a great way to further your career, um, NASA has a ton of student challenges and student uh, products and or, or you know projects and things like that that they sponsor um, that are great things for, for students to get involved in and get hands-on experience doing things. Um, and then, you know, it's, there's never been a better time to get a job in, in the space industry than, than right now. I think there's a lot of folks hiring and you, know, you walk down the exhibit hall and, and you can talk to all of them. And uh, they're anxious for, for fresh, fresh blood. I'd honestly like to see a lot more students in venues like this. Yeah. Invite them to conferences and get them to network and that's how things really start happening. How many students are in the audience? Excellent. Oh, that's good. Glad excellent. to see it. Excellent. Okay. Um, that was excellent. Thank you. I want to thank our, our panelists. Thank you for attending. And let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your evening. And, and don't forget Artemis. We're going forward to the moon. Don't forget. Thank you.